this next session is going to be about nudging and libertarian paternalism. I'm very pleased to have join us today Raj Shand. He is the head of schools and early years at the Behavioral Insights team, otherwise known as the Nudge Unit. And to kick us off, he's going to give a short presentation to explain what his work's all about. Please uh, give a big hand to Raj. Uh, thanks very much, Chris, and thanks to the IEA for inviting us along, and uh, thanks and well done to all of you for coming along on this uh, very sunny Saturday afternoon. Um, just before we get started into some of the philosophical issues underpinning the sorts of work that we do, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we mean by behavioural insights and the sort of work we do at the behavioural insights team, because every now and again there's some mystique, some of it justified, some not so, so I think it might just be useful for us to show you. Uh, I'm going to start off by showing you a famous experiment which underpins behavioural economics to some extent. I'm going to try to do that. There we go. Okay, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, you may or may not have heard of them. Um, they ran this experiment, uh, different versions of it in the 70s. I'm going to show you a version they did it in 1981. Imagine that you're a policy maker in the US, right? So they ran this experiment with five or 600 people and it's been replicated many times. Now, you're, you're, I'm going to do this experiment with you. Imagine you're a policymaker in the US and you're preparing for the outbreak of an unusual Asian disease. Now, kind of a sign of the times. I don't know why the fact that it's an Asian disease means anything at all. I presume it's worse in some way, but you know, I guess we'll find out, we'll find out. Uh, which is expected to kill 600 people, which you know, I think is bad. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that we know, and this never happens in policy, I assure you that, assume that we know the exact scientific estimate of the consequences of the programs and you're going to choose between them, all right? So, um, here's a dilemma. If program A is adopted, 200 people will be saved. Alternatively, if you go with program B, a third probability that 600 people will be saved, but a two-thirds probability that no people will be saved at all, okay? Now, I'd like everybody to put their hands up, please. Everybody. Everybody must put their hand up. One is fine. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, it's like a very polite hip-hop gig. Everyone put one hand up, thank you. Now, keep your hand up if you think on the most part people went for A, and put it down if you think they went for B. Decent number of you thinking A, some for B. All right, you can all put your hands down, thank you. Secondly, a different group of people have shown this. If program C is adopted, 400 people will die. Right? We know this for sure. If program D is adopted, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die, a two-third probability that 600 people will die. Again, everybody put your hands up, please. Everybody put your hands up. Thank you. Keep your hand up if you think people went for C, and put it down if you think people went for D. Okay, I think in this case, people are saying most people probably went for D. Now, many of you, smiling to yourselves, what can you tell me about these two? They're the same. Mathematically, they're the same. In what sense are they different? I'm going to pretend that that mumble said exactly what I want you to say. <laughs> uh, you called it right. In A, uh, sorry, in problem one, about three quarters of people go for A. And in this one, about three quarters of people go for D. Okay? And it's just the framing. It's just the language. It's mathematically identical. All right? Now, some of you might be economics undergrads. Some of you will be economics undergrads. Some of you will be thankful to never be economics undergrads. Right? That's not the point. <laughs> what happens is when you're learning first year micro, the foundation of what you're doing and everything else after that is like expected utility theory, right? People take probabilities, they weight them against the payoffs, and from there, all sorts of wonderful, hyper-rational things happen, okay? And Danny Kahneman is a psychologist and just wanders along and goes, no, not really, that's just not what people do. It very much depends on the framing. Program A, if you're a policymaker and you're going, look, I'm telling you for sure you can save 200 people, or if you want, you can take a risk, right? You've got 200 lives in the bank and you can take a risk, and politicians are going, yeah, I don't really fancy that. I'm not sure about that, right? You know, I don't want to be the person that had 200 lives they could definitely have saved and then sort of gamble with it. In problem two, you're saying, look, 400 people are already dead here, right? They're already gone. And people are going, well, what the hell? Let's take a risk. Now, I worked in the city for a long time as a trader, and I can tell you this perfectly captures gambling behavior, all right? When you're winning, people become very, very risk averse. And when you're losing, people just think, what the hell? I'm just going to have a go, right? I'm going to send the goalkeeper up into the opposing box for the last few minutes. It doesn't really matter, right? Just throw caution to the wind. 
But the point is sometimes whether you're winning or losing is actually just perception. It's just the framing of it. Okay? And we make these mistakes in a pretty predictable and reliable way. Okay? And with some thought, we can correct them, but the initial intuition is not always right. Now, Danny Kahneman, because he's such a big man, obviously, he goes on to win the Nobel Prize in economics, even though he's a psychologist. He does it without even trying. Some people are just like that. What can you do? And decades of behavioral science research will show you in one slide here. He goes, look, you've got two ways of thinking. You've got system one, it's fast. If I ask you guys what's two times six, the answer appears in your head whether you want it to or not. It's just there, right? Every day that you guys are going to school or work or wherever it is that you're going, you're going on an autopilot whilst you're listening to a podcast and also checking out somebody on the other side of the street or whatever, and it's all intuitive, effortless. On the other hand, you've got system two. This is hard. This burns calories. This is studying for an exam. It's finding your way to the Royal Ge Geographic Society today, working out where the right entrance is, because you're going, is this, is it? I can see people inside. Almost, right, right. It's that kind of thinking, right? Now, the vast majority of the time, people think they're in system two. They, that's what they identify themselves as being. But we're not. The vast majority of the time, you're in system one. You go to Hyde Park, and you see a swan wandering around. Are this swans in Hyde Park? A pigeon, whatever there is. And it's just walking around in this aimless way and go, there's a bit of food. They look nice. Mm, what's that smell? That's what we're doing the vast majority of the time. And we have to. We can't be thinking all the time. We would never get anything done, and we'd never get invited to dinner parties and be boring, right? You have to be relying on these heuristics to get by. But it does affect your decision making, right? This has been around a while. But in 2010, the coalition government said, you know, David Cameron in 2008, wondering how his life would turn out, I guess. He's reading a copy of Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, which was saying, you can take behavioral science and you can use it to improve government policy. So they say, OK, we're going to find ways, intelligent ways, to encourage support and enable people to make better choices for themselves. That's a direct quote from the coalition agreement. Lots of things from that didn't quite survive. You may remember the big society, right? Well, you may not remember the big society. It depends on how old you are. Um, but the Behavioural Insights team and applying government policy, uh, applied behavioural science to government policy, did survive. We started off in cabinet office, just about half a dozen of us. Uh, all those guys are still there, actually. And we've since set up an office in uh, Australia. We've actually spun out, so we're a cons consultancy now. We've got office in New York, uh, Singapore, and also for the really lucky people who are stationed out in Manchester, we've got an office up there as well. And there's about 150 of us, okay? And we're applying behavioural science to policy. I'm going to show you two examples very quickly, and then we're going to get into the discussion. Um, let's skip over that. One, how can we encourage people to save for retirement? I mean, it's, 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 it's lovely to be young, right? I, I hope for most of you, you're not spending much time thinking about your pension. I am approaching my 38th birthday, and I'm suddenly thinking, shit, what am I going to do when I retire, right? And suddenly I had to start thinking about this thing. This is just a massive problem. People don't save enough for the future. They just don't. You'll be taught into temporal substitution. Oh, what people do is they just balance consumption today versus consumption tomorrow. Yeah, kind of, kind of. The main reason that I don't have a pension, even when I worked in the city for nine years and I earned good money, and even though I kind of expected most of the time to live to 80, is I looked at the forms and I thought, I just can't be bothered, right? That is basically it. And I'm prepared to risk a life of destitution in my 60s and 70s just because forms look boring, all right? <laughs> so we thought, well, what, what, how can we just make this easier? How can we go along with behavioral science? Why did I get you all to put your hands up? Why did I default you into participation? Because once your hand is up, you are in the game, right? And that's it. We did the same thing with pensions. We defaulted people into it. And if you don't want a pension, that's cool. Just fill the other form out and just say, I don't want it anymore. This is what happened. Before auto enrollment, this is how many people had pensions. Large employers a bit more, all right? Good chunk of the population. The government has huge information programs, huge tax subsidies. And classical economists, such as I used to be, would say, this is fine. It's people just optimizing their preferences. People don't really want pensions other than that. They're enjoying spending their money now on ice creams and whatever it is. But we just defaulted them into it, and a huge chunk of the population just went, yeah, all right then. Okay? You make the fundamental consumption change for them in their lifetime, and people just go, thanks for that, and go back to watching Coronation Street. And you just made their life a lot easier. Second one. Oh, excuse me. How can we encourage high-achieving pupils at underrepresented schools to apply to more competitive universities? The language there is very careful. Uh, Oxbridge, as you all know, like, and other Russell Group, for want of a better, better terming, they'll get a bollocking once every year about not admitting enough kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. And then they will say, quite, well, in their minds, quite reasonably, is, look, these young people, they just don't apply. 
right? We can show you they don't apply. So it's like at the point that they apply, they're even more likely to get in, but they don't apply. In my opinion, do something about getting them to apply, all right? But that's, that's and I'm going to show you something that we did to try and do that. So I was teaching uh, economics at Bristol. Unbeknownst to me, well, let's not go into that story. I would say, I think the simplest way of describing Bristol is the poshest university in the country, just for shorthand, we haven't got much time. So I'm teaching university at Bristol, at, at economics at Bristol, and I'm talking to one of my undergrads there, Ben, and I go, Ben, you're not posh. Do me a favour. Uh, well, first of all, are you having a nice time here? And he goes, yeah, I love it. I love it. I go, how did you come here? And he said, some mates of mine were coming here to get pissed from South Wales. I came along. Next thing you know, I've enrolled in the university. And you go, oh, that's a nice story. I said, Ben, can you write a letter within an experiment we're going to text, or we're going to test, just encouraging kids who got, who got good GCSEs, who go to schools, which just don't send kids to Bristol. Nobody knows anyone who's been to Bristol. Nobody even knows that it's a different university from UWE, perhaps. All right? Maybe if, everybody goes, if anybody goes anywhere, they go to the local university, because that's just kind of what kids from those sorts of backgrounds go. None of the teachers have been to a university like Bristol. Okay? A simple letter where Ben says, I used to be like you. right? And I took a chance, and I came here, and I'm having a great time. And Ben somehow returned 12,000 of these letters hand-signed to me. I've never asked how he did it. That's fine. And this is the result, which we tested in an experiment with 12,000 odd kids that did their GCSEs. And here we go. The control group, these did not get the letter, 8.5% of those kids, they didn't just apply, they didn't just get accepted in the control group, they actually went there. All right? This is, this is where we're looking, they actually went there. 8.5% is low. I don't know what that is compared to more advantaged groups, but it's pretty low. They got this letter, you got that up to 11.4%. Okay? Now, none of you are going to like spontaneously combust, I realise that. But that's increasing it by about a third. All right? And it's just a letter. And all you did was make a social connection between somebody who's in that university and a kid who doesn't know anything about it. And the kid doesn't just apply. They don't just get offered the place. They actually go. All right? So I'm just trying to make the case here that behavioral, behavioral science... Look, Amazon use it all the time. You want to buy almost anything, one-click buying, and then recommended purchase off your friends, it's amazing. And in government, we're increasingly use it, respecting people's liberty to still make the choices they want, but help them make better choices for themselves. That's a quick overview. Over to Chris. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you mentioned there that you're now a global organisation. Uh, is the perception of the nudge unit and nudging different in America to what it is here? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, so the perception in the UK uh, is that we... Perception in different places, I guess. Uh, sometimes we get thought of as being this, this Tory, this conservative idea that we're into like a laissez-faire kind of government making and we're sort of... You know, some people might look at um, widening participation in universities and just want to legislate or take heavier-handed routes. And they sort of see us sometimes as being, you know, laissez-faire and not in interfering in people's lives and maybe even holding back proper change. And they see that as a conservative thing. In America, the Behavioural Insights team in the White House was set up under Obama. And the, polit the political perspective there sees nudging as this big government nanny state interfering in people's lives. And it's completely different just depending on who happened to be the person that set it up, which is classic behavioural science, right? I mean, just sort of seeing who the person is that sets it up, whether or not we think it's a good idea, we're just sort of prejudging on what we actually think it is. Singapore's a different thing entirely because it's a culture so different from, from either of ours. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Sunstein have used the term libertarian paternalism. I think yeah. from, the, from the outset they used that. Is that a term that you kind of, you accept that? You relate to that term? I think it's pretty good, but I think <clears throat> it's not something that we talk about that much anymore at BIT, I don't think. I think we think about them ourselves as uh, just helping to improve the effectiveness of government policy mm. and not just working with government, but working with other organisations as well, just for social purpose goals. And we like the fact that what we're doing is not necessarily legislative and not necessarily telling people what to do, but in other instances... We just want to make things better. And if we're looking at it going, this isn't a tool for behavioural science, we would suggest sometimes to the government, yeah, we haven't got anything for you here, we would suggest you just legislate. And it is, it is nice. We don't have to get involved in that kind of debate as much. And I don't think it's... 
I don't think it's a live issue as much as it used to be, this kind of where do you sit on the political spectrum. One thing I've noticed since the book came out, really, is that a lot of people have very strong views on it either way hmm. without having ever read it. I was on the Moral right. Maze years ago talking about right. this issue, and it became very obvious to me that I was the well, one of the only people. One of the, Richard Thaler was one of the guests. Obviously, he read the book, but nobody else, either the witnesses or the people questioning us, seemed to read the book. And there were, there were the whole thing was basically a straw man argument on both sides because this is incredibly manipulative. You're trying to you know, do this, or no, this is incredible. Yeah. The, the people didn't seem to have any. Um, real understanding of what it was. And when you read the book, I mean, I think it's a lot more libertarian than it is paternalistic. They spend about three pages talking about whether it's appropriate to uh, force motorcyclists to wear crash helmets, you know, the right. kind of debates that are just dead in the water in this country. I wrote down um, a few paternalistic policies, and I thought we could go through them, and you could tell me whether you think they're nudges or not. Sounds good. Some of these have been described as, as nudges before. Some of them haven't. Sure. Most of them involve uh, health issues, which tends to be... Um, one of the big areas where you, you've con constantly got a kind of political dialogue about doing things. Um, presumed consent for organ donations. Uh, that is considered to be a nudge where you change the default. So the pensions one, where you are just saying, right, uh, we're just changing the onus of the initial bit of admin mm. from you to us, and you can opt out at any time. Technically, it's not changing your liberty to whether or not you're going to Change those. So, changing defaults is a nudge, in our opinion. Yeah. Minimum pricing for alcohol. Minimum pricing for alcohol is a complicated one. So, like, you know, what is a nudge? And you can you can argue that, and uh, Cass Sunstein would be a lot better guess than me for sure. Um, I think nudges are about using behavioural science to get disproportionate impacts from what you've actually done here. The unit pricing from alcohol is complicated because it very much depends on the degree it's being set, uh, and I think just imposing a minimum price on something and seeing that demand, there are demand responses and supply responses, there's nothing that economists aren't looking at that already. Right, that's just economics. It's yeah, exactly, economics. quite. Yeah. But I do think there is a special case where, for example, the sugar tax on, on fizzy drinks, for example, um, which hasn't even come in yet, when people... The, there's a difference between zero, between zero cost and a penny, which is different to a penny to two pence. Right? There is just something going on when something is free and something when there is this nominal levy. So, for example, plastic bag levies coming in at, at 5p. I don't believe that people who are no longer using plastic bags are making some, you know, are optimising along their demand curve and going, you know, I work out how many plastic bags I use and it's going to be like £2.65 over the course of this month and I need that money. I don't think it's that. I think there is a signal there which people also do respond to, mm. which has a value in itself beyond, the beyond price, classical yeah. economics, right? Uh, limiting the amount of paracetamol you can buy from chemists just to, to, to discourage people from topping themselves. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the it depends on the um, on the way the limiting is done. So for some of, I mean, I, I'm just sort of shaking off a cold at the moment. So every now and again, I've got mixed levels of sinus reverb in my voice. Uh, I've been going through the paracetamol, and yes, you have to push them out through those little packets. And many of you will be too young to remember this. You used to get little twist caps. So once you've opened it you know, go nuts, have 50 paracetamol at a time. One of the reasons they put them in those little packets to pop them out slowly is because it did seem to limit suicides, right? And this is an interesting thing about the fragility of something as fundamental as killing yourself. After you've popped out the fourth paracetamol, you go, I can't be arsed with this. And then they're like, <laughs> and they're like you know, they go like, England versus Belgium isn't that bad. Like, it'll be over, it'll be over in an hour and I'll go and do something else. So... I think if it's, if it's just the, the, the packets, that's a nudge. If it's like the pharmacist literally won't sell you something, that's a regulation, and that's more... That's, you know, that, I wouldn't think that's us. Uh, making smokers take out a licence to buy cigarettes with a small fee, which has to be renewed every year. Uh, it just sounds like a regulation. I mean, if you're making somebody do something, uh, that sounds like a regulation to me. And arguably, they still have to do that, but... So much of that depends on the configuration of the way these things are done. And this is one of the things that sort of... We try to take the philosophical heat out of a lot of policies. We're just saying, just, you know, tuition fees, for example. The way, it could be, the way you could describe the current policy, you could describe it in three or four different ways, similar to the prospect theory, the, the different policy dilemma. I could, we could have mathematically identical things which are described in completely different ways, and then one becomes a nudge or it doesn't, just in the way it's described. And so it depends on the detail. That was one that Julian Legrand came up with when he read Nudge. He immediately, okay, immediately yeah. said, here's a good nudge. Let's force smokers to do this and that. Well, I mean, sometimes, sometimes uh, 
It, it's great that there's enthusiasm within Whitehall for behavioural science. That's a terrific thing. Sometimes it will, it will wander a little bit. And, you know, anyway, sorry. Uh, well, another one about smoking. Graphic warnings on cigarettes, cigarette packs. Again, that to me seems to be a nudge. I, th I think, you know, you're not, inflicting, uh, you're not impinging on anybody's liberty to buy the cigarettes. You are taking something which they know. They know it. And they're just, you're just making it more salient. Do you think you're... Because one of the definitions of nudge they use in the book, which I think is quite important, they, do, sure. they re 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 while, so be reiterate yeah. this a few times. Yeah. Um, they say it's about altering any aspect of the choice architecture in a way that alters people's behaviour in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. And that, that bit about changing their economic incentives is a pretty uh, big limit. It's a, it really limits you from doing a lot of things. So it, it, would, it would stop you from charging smokers even £10 to have a smoking licence. And arguably, if the graphic warnings are making people feel worse about smoking or they're so gruesome that they, they, uh, they, you know, their consumer surplus is reduced, you could say that that breaks their rule. Right, you could. I mean, one of the things about utility functions, and this is one of the nice things about if you're an academic economist, you just go, there's a utility function, I don't really care what's going into it, I'm just going to back out behaviour from that, right? I mean, like, you're absolutely right. I mean, if somebody gets... In one sense, if somebody used to, and let's not say who this person is, it might be me, it might not be, if somebody used to, after dinner on a summer's evening, used to love going outside and having a cigarette with a coffee, which is sort of like after that, and just sort of chatting with people, and sort of pretentiously discuss French philosophy or whatever that kind of thing is. I, I miss that, right? I genuinely miss that. That is utility foregone on my part. And that's something I will probably miss always. On the other hand, I've just been on holiday with my dad for three weeks, and it reminds me, thank God I stopped smoking when I did, because the guy's had a cough for 15 years, all right? And so the consumer surplus has no time dimension to it. It's incredibly complicated. Utility functions are philosophical constructs which enable us to then do other things analytically. It's, it, it's, a, it's a nice description to start with. I think the idea that that place is a fierce boundary and it means no, you know, nudges of, sometimes they're going to be cussless, often they're not. But you're work, working out, does it have a disproportionate benefit? In retrospect, does me foregoing a cigarette in those evenings have a disproportionate benefit for me later? And was some slightly heavy-handed campaigning at the time worth it? In, in my opinion, yes. But I'm sympathetic to people who say no. I want to ask you about preferences because obviously mm. yeah, m m mainstream economics doesn't take stated preferences very seriously. It tends to just look at what people actually do. Um, there's an example in this is David Halpern's book. He's the guy who says mm. up in the he, he gives an example in here um, of an, one of many experiments, behavioural experiments he looks at, in which a group of people are offered uh, a choice of films and a choice of food. Right. And when it's going to be for next week, they pick the highbrow films and they pick the healthy food. Mm. And when it's going to be delivered immediately, they pick the ice cream and mm. the, the lowbrow film. And he, in the book, argues that this proves um, that people's true... Essentially, he argues that people's true preferences are for the, the highbrow things and the healthy foods, but they are held back by the, the you know, immediate wants and temptations. It seems to me it proves the exact opposite. It seems to me that it proves that what people actually want is ice cream and lowbrow food. You know, there, there's, there's no manipulation, there's no cost involved. All this stuff was going to be free. They, it seems to me that people know what they are supposed to, to do, but it's not actually what they want. There's a, there's a, okay, so the phenomenon you described in there is, please, you brought it up, it's called hyperbolic discounting. And many of you do economics, you learn about discounting, right? Which is that something in the future far away, we discount it, we just sort of go, oh, it's a long way away, it's less important to me, and I, you, therefore what I enjoy today is more. But the discount rate does change depending on when we're talking about. In, in 15, if you ask me, in, it would be true if people never regretted it, right? So the number of times... Uh, again, this may or may not be me. It's me, for sure. So, like, I, you know, I'll get home from the pub and I've just been like, oh, I could make this healthy thing, but I'm sort of tired and all that sort of stuff. So I just order a pizza. I'm eating a pizza at one in the morning. The second I've had the last mouthful, I go, shit, I didn't really need that. Do you know what I mean? I could have had a slice of toast and some hummus and I would have been just as well off. But in the moment, we are different people in a way that can't really be described. Now, you're asking me, which is the one true person? They can both be us, Chris. We can have multiple management without getting all sort of cosmic and spiritual about it. We can have multiple manifestations of ourselves, and who's to say which is the one true self? But we do know that sometimes there are decisions we make in the moment which don't bear any 
like later we look at it ourselves and go, what the hell was I thinking? And that's not just sort of when but we go... But isn't that because people get an enormous amount of pleasure out of, for example, eating the, the deep pan pizza? It is, but it's not always rational. Sometimes we might do it when we, like, you know, commit adultery or do other serious things, and you can sort of later go, well, I was just optimising preferences, my darling, I'm sorry. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> at the time, the example which people tend to understand is, look, I was drunk, I was in the moment, and I went for it, and I regret it deeply. When people, like, look, if somebody's just sort of going, you know what, in the future, if I, I, have, a, I have a pizza, I'm, you know, 20% overweight, I'm happy with my life, I go, cool, good for you. I'm not going to tell you, like, what body shape you should be. That's great. Like, you know, go and enjoy your life. I do some things in my life which certainly are not considered optimal. But what's interesting there is there's an internal contradiction in that person's preferences. They kind of have a sense of the person they want to be. Hmm. And now you cannot, like, you know, some of your narrative seems to be that this has been prescribed elsewhere and they don't really want that. But I don't think that's always true because when you give people the chance to commit themselves to that long-term, to that uh, long-term, more virtuous behaviour, often they take it. They seem to actually buy what we call commitment devices to bind their hands, to stop them from doing it. An example that I have is that whenever I have to study uh, on my internet browser, I use a thing called uh, Stay Focused, and that stops me from wasting time on Facebook and Twitter, where I'll be, you know, or YouTube, where I'm watching your videos and the like. And it stops me from doing that, and it helps me to get on with the work I actually need to do, because I know in the long term, I need to get my work done and complete my PhD. And I know that in the moment, I just won't do it, right? So I bind my own hands. And this is, you know, if, if you were right, then there would be no appetite for commitment devices, and there is. There is, indeed, yeah, but that's, you know, it doesn't involve the government. And if we're talking about public policy, even if it's fairly mild nudging, um, I think we need to be sure what people's true preferences are. I can totally see that you know, if 90% of people say they, they want to leave their organs to somebody after they die and only 40% bother to fill in the form, mm. that uh, is almost certainly a true preference. There's no real cost to giving your organs away when you die. But when it comes down to, for example, a large number of people at any given time say they want to lose weight, but the, their day-to-day -day preferences don't seem to suggest that at all. Lots of people say they want to different career, they want to start a new job but make no effort to do mm. it. Lots of people say they want to emigrate. These are all things that people could quite relatively easily do. Are we to take those stated preferences as if they're the true ones and then try and change cho choice architecture so to I'm, I'm, push them in that direction? I'm not advocating forcing anybody to lose weight. What we are, what we are saying is, predictably, people who want to lose... I used to have a lot of vices, Chris, and like I have fewer now. And I think I understand these pretty well. And there is a reason. These things are not always easy to give up. It depends. It depends. There are distributions of our ability to control ourselves. Some people are ex exceptionally good at it. Some of us are not so good at it. I am not so good at it. And I no longer put myself in situations where I will sort of, you know, betray my own long-run long interests. Now, I've had a lot of various different people help me with that kind of thing. But this kind of stuff could just be made easier. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are happy to make money off you and your inability to control yourself in the short term. And all we're saying is, if you equip people with tools which are entirely voluntary, which they can identify that they need to help them resist that temptation in the immediate term, if that's something they want to do, I don't see how that's anything other than a good thing. Okay, one last question, and then we'll, hmm. go, we'll go to the, the audience for a few minutes. Um, it's always struck me that if we were serious about the libertarian paternalism, you know, as roughly described by Thaler and Sunstein, um, we are accepting the idea that actually it's wrong, basically, for the government to use force for our own good, right? That's why that's why the libertarian bit comes in. I know David in the book says, I think he says that probably the, the best thing that the unit has ever done is to persuade the government a few years ago not to do anything with e-cigarettes, just to leave them alone. These are a, these are a, a, a good tool. Um, is it fair to say that if we took Thalen Sunstein's worldview and applied it to policy, we would have to repeal hundreds and hundreds of laws? Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, well, all we get is kind of, here's some suggestions of, let's do this, let's do this. We don't hear so much about, we should not do this. We, we, yeah, this no, is too paternalistic. The nudge unit can't go along with this because it's, it goes beyond our principles. We try to, we try to pose that question in a gentle way. I, I, as mentioned, I work in education research. It's my main area of specialty. Uh, what I will do is I will take clever ways to help kids do better, Kids, uh, teenagers particularly, they're still developing their self-control 
in the moment they'll do some pretty crazy stuff. And we help them to study, we help them to do better. And designing an intervention and testing in schools, can we try this new extra thing? That's hard, but it's way, way easier than saying to schools, you know this other thing you've been doing for like 40 years? Have you thought of just not doing that? And they go, what do you mean? Right? And yes, you're right. I think one of the, I think one of the interesting things about behavioural science is um, we brought this idea of behavioural science to government. I think there's two things we're doing. One is behavioural science, and the other is evaluation. How do you know what you're doing is actually working? Do you have any clue? And we don't phrase it so directly, but the conversation we're trying to start is not necessarily repealing laws, but like we're talking most of the time our stuff is like, you know, the, the skin of the apple in terms of government expenditure. We're saying, look at everything you do. How do we know any of this stuff works? And can we start evaluating that more robustly? And I think that's very much part of our mission statement. Repealing laws, not yet. I would suggest first we study it. Absolutely. Right, have we got any questions from the audience? We've got a microphone somewhere. Uh, we've got lots here. I'll um, take just one down the front here, because he's nearest to you. And in fact, could we take three? Uh, because we've got so many. Um, also down the front, and the lady there. Hi. Um, I recently read Misbehaving, which is by Richard Thaler. And at the, the final chapter in it was, I think, something entitled What Next? Hmm. Um, and it was, the whole, the whole book was sort of where he came from as a traditional economist and now how he's developed into a behavioural economist. How do you think uh, nudging can really be used effectively in the future? And in what kinds of uh, government policy do you think they can be used in? And, Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'll take, take a, a couple sure, more. Sure, take them as a group. Sure. Uh, the lady here in the second row. Um, do you think people can be trained to make optimal decisions? And do you think it's more effective if it comes from the government? Or should we take our own responsibility and use these sort of commitment programmes to help ourselves make more optimal decisions? And you? Sir? Yep. And gentlemen here. I will come further back in the room in the next round of questions. Would you support the current seatbelt regulation? And if not, how would you weigh up the costs of putting on the seatbelt versus the risk of dying or being injured if you do not, in regards to your conception of rationality and how you measure utility, etc.? Sure. Shall I go with those? First one here, what next? So... Uh, Richard Thaler, in that, in that chapter of the book, he talks specifically about education, now an entirely vested interest. I do think like, this is my area of specialty. Um, and this speaks to this lady's point here as well about whether or not people can be trained to make better decisions. Uh, yes, they can be, right, for sure. The initial problem that I showed you, right, people make that mistake at first, but once they see it, they do correct their behaviour. But a lot of decisions are one shot and you're done. Okay, that's true when you're going to go to university, it's true if you're going to maybe skive off the night before your exams, it's true in those cases. And I think education, particularly equipping young people to make better decisions for themselves, because the government cannot be there to design the architecture of your choice every single time. It's absolutely impossible. And we have, not speaking on behalf of the government, but certainly ourselves, we have absolutely no ambition to. Uh, one of the best things that ever happened for more intelligent eating was online shopping. When I was a student... Uh, we used to go uh, shopping when we were hungry. Frankly, when some of my friends, obviously not me, were a bit stoned, right? And then you're walking around the supermarket and people just go, well, we've come home with about 15 bags of crisps and a pizza. You eat that and you go, well, we're done, right? And you go, instead, partly because of hyperbolic discounting, you're not making decisions for this afternoon, you're making decisions for what's going to be your shopping that's arriving on Saturday. People just order smarter things. And it definitely doesn't have to be the government doing it. And yes, definitely people can learn. But... Every decision you make, there is a choice architecture. There is no neutral. So where they're having a material impact, the government might as well look at it and go, could we reconfigure this thing that already exists to help people steer them towards where they tell us they want to go? Uh, this gentleman's questions about seatbelt regulations, I've got to admit, I don't know what they are. Right? So um, I'm presuming we're all supposed to put seatbelts on pretty much all the time. Um, you know, there are these interesting philosophical questions about when is it right and when is the liberty there. And I went into the Cabinet Office uh, out of working in the city for eight or nine years, observing what happened after the bailouts. I went in there a libertarian. And in the end, I went, I just can't be bothered thinking about this kind of stuff, right? And I think, like, they're, they're like, I'm not going to be alive for that long. 
And when I die, I just want to think, with the time that I had, what did I commit my energy to? And what was I working on? And I don't think your question is trivial, but I just sort of think, if somebody else wants to pass a regulation in that, which maybe infringes on somebody else's liberty and maybe they derive a special pleasure from not wearing a seatbelt, I kind of think if it saves X lives a year, I just think, whatever, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to move on, I'm going to move on to something else because I just sort of think, like, in this short time we have on the planet, you're trying to, like, change it and make it as, do as much with it as you possibly can. I think there are, there are bigger fish to fry, and I don't know the answer to your question. I'm sorry if that's not very satisfactory. I don't think we've got time for any more. I do apologise, but I think we've pretty much... I know you've got to run off. Uh, interestingly, you became less libertarian when you started getting involved with the government. Cass Sunstein seems to have gone in the same direction as well. His more recent books are... It kind of Listen, breaks his was, golden rule a bit more. When I, when I was at school, and I wasn't from a wealthy family, I was pretty left-wing. I used to bunk off school, I used to go to socialist worker protests, and I see they're at Whitehall today. Then I worked in the city, and I became increasingly right-wing and libertarian. And now I work in government, I just think everyone should listen to the economists, right? So there you go. <laughs> right, well, thank you very All much, right. Raj. Big hand, please.